Divided by the human focus. So while AI, so set out to study artificial rivals, the human intelligence and AI on user interfaces uh, to computing for humans. And there was this, this AI being in the ACI summer uh, discussion where AI struggles and ACI forces and vice versa. And I don't think that this needs to be the case. I think see that there are many threats of synergy that are possible here, such as, for example, using machine intelligence for interaction with human partners. Uh, applications of machine intelligence in using the based technology and machine intelligence for design. Uh, it's a great honor to have three outstanding scholars today here who work at the intersection of machine intelligence and human computer interaction. Um, just a few words of why we are here and how we actually ended up here. Yesterday was Anna Pai's defense, and, and Shumi Chai uh, was the opponent uh, because he's such a scholar and, and well recognized name. And it's, as great networks, he actually attracted uh, two other scholars here, uh, Federal Business and um, Mary Smith. And now we decided to put, put together this symposium, and it's pretty really happy. Um, the symposium is officially hosted by the Phoenix Center of AI uh, at Cal, and my own research group called Using the at the School of Electrical Engineering. Uh, and the goal here is to spark discussion and start identification of what are the intellectual foundations of ACI that can genuinely incorporate uh, machine intelligence with it because much of the textbook level uh, models and theories of ACI they are from the command based era of graphical interfaces, for example. And um, I'm particularly excited about the symposium because the three speakers are not just shouting from the sidelines about you know, what machine learning or AI should do, but they have actually done uh, machine learning for ACI for, for almost two decades. And all three speakers have made not only significant and widely contributions to the academic body of leadership on this topic, uh, but there's also a fair chance to be actually using some products that are running uh, their code or their ideas. And what makes them unique is that all three have deep appreciation of not only machine learning and machine intelligence, but also human factors. And they're able to uh, formulate interaction problems in a unique way using these all lessons. And all the, the talks that you're going to hear today are significantly uh, new. Uh, to my understanding, they have not been presented in this form, at least here and maybe elsewhere. Uh, and I, I have asked the speakers uh, to take a stand uh, so that we can start deciding and building a discussion um, on, on this topic. And, and I've been asking them to answer questions like what has ACI to give to AI and machine learning, and vice versa. Uh, what would be the relationship that we have now? Uh, with deep learning and, and uh, AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence, uh, and then what are the other outstanding challenges and opportunities that we see in this space? And I'm going to introduce the first speaker now. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Shumi Chai from Google, uh, where he's a principal scientist directing research design and development of implemented systems. 
She's a member of the Academy, which is a rare uh, honor, and she's also a fellow of the Asian. Uh, in her case, work on modeling uh, keyboards and algorithm that process interaction. Uh, among others, she originally the shape writing hypothesis and then pursued it together in parallel business. And his present research at Google is behind uh, modern smart keyboards that, that we are using. And his talk today is about that the style of progresses and open resource questions in text instead of reading. And uh, we can preview a few more factors from machine the intelligence research building up uh, toward a view of why the combination of machine intelligence and human factors holds the future of ACI and information technology in Yes. Thank you, Antti. Um, it's a long, long, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I had a great time opposing uh, and uh, uh PhD thesis defense. Uh, it was such a good, conducted, well conducted, and written piece of uh, document. And uh, congratulations again, and congratulations to Antti, and congratulations to all the university to be able to produce such high quality work uh, in a short amount uh, of history. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, I will order my talk uh, towards the next input, partly because uh, Anna's thesis event yesterday, that's uh, more or less the same domain that I'm going to present. Uh, it's also, it's an uh, area, text input is an area where both HCI and machine intelligence were essential components of any product uh, being developed. Uh, I will present this work more as a reflection on many, many projects I've been involved in. Uh, I'm trying to synthesize the insights or the questions we, we still face today in combining HCI and machine intelligence together. Uh, it's a work of many people, uh, including Brola here, and uh, also done over the span of about two decades in different places, including Indian Research, Google, uh, and also Lichon University, where I met uh, Prola, who's a young, bright uh, undergraduate student. Uh, the, but the, the, the views and perspectives are truly my own in the sense that they may not be correct, they may not they may change over time. Uh, it also certainly doesn't represent Google's position. Although I'm uh, trying, I'll try to refer and relate to many of the Google uh, product companies. Uh, so, first of all, the HCI side. Uh, a school of thought in HCI is trying to build on. Um, modern technology, but also formalize them into more like engineering models so that we can quantify human performance. And ideally, if you find enough of such uh, fairly low level and robust regularities, you can stitch them together to make predictions or to make evaluations of different design choices. Uh, this is very much in that tradition of Anna presented for this yesterday, very successful. Uh, it faces many challenges as well. One of the challenges is that we just don't know that many very robust phenomena when it comes to uh, human performance and human uh, behavior. Uh, the one that typically starts uh, at almost every project in the area is so called the claw. The idea that you can relate human performance to temporal time performance as a function of spatial properties. Uh, in a very robust way, and the relationship happens to be um, quantifiable, quantifiable by entropy or by information. Uh, so that got a lot of people uh, inspired, including uh, big uh, figures like uh, Alan Neal, towards the theory of unified cognition. Uh, so that's very much the, a, a major school of thought in, in, in HDI, and there's still something more. And this, this is the HCI side of the input. I'm trying to build such elements as many. My, my team started looking at uh, beyond each law, what we can do. Uh, first, we try to find a way to apply each law. Uh, one of the uh, 
applications is uh, the policy board started like, before us, but we put this in a very systematic uh, way and start to combine it with some level of machine intelligence, namely uh, search algorithms or uh, the, the, the new to rearrange keys so that the pitch wall time from one key to another, the first order transition, uh, multiplied by the transitional frequency of that letter pair and, and sum up all together as an energy function, as a cost function. We call it uh, this diagram of energy. And that energy drives the simulated needing process of the keyboard, which is viewed as a molecule. And each key in the molecule is added. And well, the uh, origin inspiration of simulated needing algorithm comes from uh, crystals or material structure where they wanted to stay in the lowest, lowest energy state. In, in, in this case, again, the energy is defined by analogy to human movement. Uh, so uh, we had some success with that and we tried to carry that on, on onward uh, by uh, applying the same plot elsewhere. Uh, in particular, uh, we tried to uh, look at the shape of the uh, energy, uh, energy uh, minimization results. And typically, the shape of the shape of the of the minimum energy state is quite flat. So it's not a unique single addition that gives you lowest energy in every else is uh, much higher. So it's not a sharp ditch in our experience. It's a very, very uh, uh, flat uh, valley floor, if you will. And because of that, we try to say, well, these energy states are all similar after many trials of, of, uh, of um, uh, essentially hill climbing or, or uh, guided by both Boltzmann functions and so on and so forth. But the results is that we can take advantage of that by accommodating, uh, to accommodate other dimensions. Uh, one dimension might be learning, another dimension might be multilingual because so if one keyboard is optimized, say, for Chinese, uh, does that still work for English? Because English, the letter transition probably is, will distrib be distributed differently from Chinese as one would imagine. So uh, if you optimize just for one language, it will not work for the other. But because of this very flat value floor, we find that you can often combine them. In fact, the largest combination we found was Chinese, German, English, uh, French, Italian, uh, fixed key plus, plus Chinese. And that result, total results was almost good, as good as for each one of them. So there's no, that much of a, a, a combination. That's our experience. Uh, so the moving beyond this law is that what other physical or uh, low level human performance regularities have found find in the same spirit of each law so we can apply these as beauty blocks to user interface design. Uh, one of them is crossing. Uh, we uh, model that's uh, essentially also another form of Fitz law, but it's the, the action is instead of pointing at a single restricted area or target, you cross another uh, graphical object. And that has particular uh, meanings or significance as an interaction of vocabulary in HCI. Uh, the yet another form is that instead of having a point constraint, you have continuous constraints on uh, of the moment, which is what we call steering. Um, yet, not all this effort was still not enough. Uh, there are you know, some today that can be built as a classic HDI research effort. They still weren't enough to describe what we eventually wanted to model, which is human gesture. Human gesture is much more open, much less visually constrained. So, we began to try to find build models that would reflect the time complexity or the time cost of different properties of gesture or, or gesture set. Uh, here we came up with a model we call CLC, which is not very elegant, but fairly practical. That is, you can basically, basically break down all gestures into three types of elements corners, uh, curves, and straight lines. And each of them actually has a little bus uh, equation to describe their time uh, complexity. And then you can add them together to form, to predict any gesture. Or when you have a gesture set, you have a different frequency, and you can use this knowledge to optimize that. 
uh, uh, finding regularities in, in human performance is just not it's not limited to just uh, just human movement or motor skills. It's also uh, uh, useful, even you, you arguably arguably even more useful. You can find robust regularities to cognitive behavior. In this case, we are uh, very interested in the notion of uh, how to direct users skill from recognition based to recall based uh, because typically high performance are recall based uh, like playing piano or typing or riding a bicycle most of those are these, these are subconscious open loop uh, skill set rather than guys point of the of the control process with uh, closed loop attention uh, to the task. Uh, so uh, the idea that, that idea to facilitate this process, uh, most notably uh, the notion of market making. But we did it quite differently. As we view keyboard as a map of human action, but not action itself in the tagging and individual letters. We view that this letters really tells you uh, kind of landmarks on a map, but you connect these landmarks to a shape, and that shape ultimately become the uh, the representation of a word. In this case, in fact, by type Q I Q U I C K, it's of course quick, but if you think it as a trajectory, and that trajectory forms a shape, uh, that shape itself can be the fundamental representation of it. But but what's Psychologically important is that that forms a natural chunk of information processing, and that gets you to high performance. And the metaphors over time, you will look less but act more, or recall more, based on memory. So this is why we call it shape writing. The idea of using shape as the fundamental unit of, uh, of fundamental representation of, of information. Uh, we also call it progressive user interfaces in the sense that the progress is from Recall uh, memory, uh, I'm sorry, visual uh, feedback driven uh, slow process to a more efficient recall driven process. Uh, the rest, as they say, the rest is history today. This gesture typing is one of the major uh, methods in uh, applied in a lot of places. Uh, many major products from large companies, small companies, and uh, estimated, um, estimated today of billions of devices. The, Google's offering today called Gboard alone has 800 million installs today. Uh, but uh, even for traditional HDI, we always run into this harder challenge in terms of what ultimately is the ground truth. Uh, so how do we evaluate that? So we have some theoretical inspirations while we develop like the shape writing idea. But you can argue, analyze in many ways, well, because it's more motor control wise more economical you have to go up and down or because you um, as I said because the visual driven uh, the, the, the recall driven process the chunking process and so on and so forth but nonetheless these are analysis or arguments they are not literally from truth but how do you get from truth has always been a challenge uh, whenever uh, user performance or skill or design uh, involves work because the learning becomes making it much more dynamic. Uh, it's just hard to make measure a single point and make a conclusion on the ultimate truth. So this is actually relatively recent work with Frola and his, and his student. Um, just let's just do this perfectly at scale and importantly both in the lab and in the lab by tracking and prompting them to give performance. Uh, and we measure that. But ultimately, what I really like about this work is that one drug choose in end is people, your end users vote with, with their feet. They move their behavior, they change their behavior. And this is quite evident, the strongest evidence in, in this uh, uh, study, where we give users both versions of keyboard. They can either tap or you can gesture. At the beginning of the study, most people corresponds to more or less at the time uh, the general population, like something like 20% of people know and use shape writing or gesture typing. The other 80% use for either very little or didn't know about it. So the two bars reflects the relative uh, frequency of tapping versus gesture. And when we 
important uh, what happens is at the end of the study, uh, almost everything switches to just typing as the primary way of different, different texts. So we voted with the feed, and that is a very strong evidence about uh, user performance or, or design. Uh, now, going back to the, the basics uh, in terms of uh, from a, a from a decoding, from a mathematical, mathematical principle point of view. It's actually quite simple. So the problem space is that in text input, it's always user give you some indication. And increasingly, the indication is more fuzzy, more ambiguous, uh, more uh, error, noisy, than very clean each keystroke corresponds to each correct error. So increasingly, like a mobile or, a, for example, Chinese text input, from the beginning, it was ambiguous input, noisy input. So given noisy input signal S, and you want to decode or figure out what's the best likely, most likely word corresponding to that input. And the age-old base rule gave us a way to track that nut by dividing the problem into two smaller and simpler, more manageable parts. One is that you figure out the distribution of uh, for each part of the word. You figure out this, the word is the other way around. Given word, what's the prop, uh, distribution of, of, uh, of spatial signal? And then you use that to combine that to, again, simple base rule with the context, which gives you a priori estimate about word distributions. If I say how are, following by you would be uh, three. Uh, 10% or 30% probably. Uh, how are things? Would be another 10% and so on and so forth. So that be a strong probability estimate. And combining that too, we we'll can say so this in principle fairly easily. But the details is what matters. First of all, what is the spatial model? What is this? What is the distribution statement? That's where traditional education. So that's why I was giving this introduction to. Uh, I've actually this is much, much many years later when we come to when I already joined Google and we come to realize that the class is actually doesn't apply to touch screens. It doesn't apply in a straightforward way, straightforward way to uh, touch screens. So we have to first remodel this law for finger touch. And there's a reason, obvious reason that it doesn't apply. That is, this law is about relative precision. So relative, relative precision is expressed as information. Uh, but uh, but finger touch, a lot of it is constrained by the finger absolute precision itself. So we have to, to, to decompose that, to reformulate this law to accommodate the absolute uh, error in human touch. Uh, that is still not enough because there's further complexity to uh, touch screen operation. Here's an example is that we find that People actually have different biases. Often people think, oh, this seems to be on iPhone and Android phones, this seems to be different. There seems to be different amount of bias when you tap on a screen. Uh, and we found actually it's it's not that simple. It, that is, it's really, it really depends on which finger, how you hold the phone, as well as where you tap. For example, this uh, illustration shows that when you tap with, uh, let's say, uh, a single thumb versus a single finger versus two thumb, uh, two thumbs. You'll find the bias uh, shift in different directions. So they have different biases. So that leads us to think: if you have different, uh, let me switch to here first. If you have different models that specifically target at thumb versus finger versus uh, two thumbs, you will have a much better prediction of where your touch point will land for a given length in this uh, similar case of a spatial model. Uh, then if you have that, and you can build much better decoders because you have a better spatial model. The trouble is that in reality, people like they will type mostly with two thumbs. The next moment when they say hold a cup of coffee or start walking, they'll start to type with one thumb and sometimes they'll type with a finger. And if you build a specialized model for that, in the transition, in the transition, you actually get an hurting user, and that's not acceptable. So we developed this backup model 
to judge their performance, uh, to uh, regulate the, the decoding process. That is, it, it knows it, with confidence it is finger, then we use a finger model, uh, or when, it, when it's not confident, we use a general uh, background model to, to do that. Uh, but again, the important thing is that how do we know it actually works? And evaluation is always a challenge. In here, I'm actually very much looking forward to Brola's talk. He's going to talk about uh, evaluation in a more general way. Uh, but here, we found that you can actually do much better to, uh, indeed, you can do better by measuring some sort of measurement at the lecture level. But when the lecture level results get combined with a language model, most of the wins get absorbed by language model. So there's no improvement of time we could measure that's worthwhile to build these into products. But that's what lots of caveats as well. So I'm just trying to highlight the, uh, the uh, challenge of evaluation. Uh, the next block of this, this basic diagram is uh, language model. That is, how do we know, how do we uh, form the best prediction of word distributions in like a given context? And the classic model is the Ingram model. And today, increasingly, uh, you know, different products, most products have turned out a preference for LSTM, LSTM model based models, which tend to be uh, just taking information with, uh, with a longer span. Uh, with a longer time or, or context that span. Uh, but there are, again, once again, there's difficulty in terms of evaluating their, their uh, efficacy, rather than efficacy. But regardless of what model structure we use, the more critical element aspects of uh, the language model quality actually is in the training process, in the cleaning process, and most importantly, in the corpus that or information you have access to, the text corpus of what you have access to. Uh, so here we try to develop one way of evaluating language model that is more close to, more uh, extrinsic to language model itself. Traditional language model is evaluated by its complexity. And there's a question just like I showed earlier on the language uh, spatial model side. You will find if you have a specialized model or finger or thumb to hand postures, you can do better at the left level. But when you combine it with the language model, you may, you may or may not pay, uh, pay off. But the flip side also applies that if you have a, uh, a language model that measures better complexity on some given text, but when you combine that with the spatial model decoding, it may or may not serve the same benefit. So here we try to find a way to evaluate that in a close fashion. And the way to do that was large scale simulation. That is, we assume certain spatial model, we run a spatial model in a generative way over a large corporate amount of corporate, uh, text in real, with real, uh, real use history with, uh, with the time uh, sequence. Uh, so imagine we want to simulate, say, all of available Iron corpus over three, four years of all the employees. Uh, as they change topic, as the company changed from, say, being a financial company to essentially a legal matter discussion, then the content may change. And if your language model adapts to it, in the transition, it may once again have either benefit or, or, or challenges in terms of ultimate performance. So we use such a process to evaluate the uh, performance of, uh, uh, of language models. Uh, here, this, to my knowledge, is probably the most systematic, but arguably still a baseline study of how effective language model really is to text input. So this is a simple form of text input that is tapping on touch screens one letter at a time, and it gets decoded into words, uh, and that without any language model, without even a vocabulary, that error is about 40%. So 40% of words will be wrong, because about 10% of the touch points will fall outside of the uh, uh, each target key, and you combine that by the fact that each um, average word has uh, about five letters, you will get to about 40% of error, word level error. So, but once you have a language model, even a, a rudimentary language model, uh, combined with the, uh, with the decoding, and you get uh, about 60% error rate at word level. Uh, 
and so on and so forth. So, so on and so forth. You can get another obvious uh, improvement by personalizing the language model. Here we try this very simple cache model with, uh, with uh, a, a linear uh, blending between a base model, a background model versus a cache model that adapts over time. Uh, now, let me go back to more HCI side. The language model is always trying to put with machine intelligence uh, ideas. Basically, always they have has always been better. Uh, uh, like either in grand or LSTM models were all completely driven by uh, statistics. Uh, on the spatial model side, uh, we begin to look into like typing is very relatively straightforward, but how people generate gestures given a word. So we want to figure that again that spatial model. Give a word how people are like, most likely to gesture, to draw a gesture. So here we went back to the classic psychology, but put a modest spin on it. A classic uh, human motor control theory or principle is medium jerk. That is, people you want it a lot tend to be either more elegant or smoother or lazier, but it all comes down to minimizing the third derivative of movement. First derivative being the speed. Acceleration, it turns out minimizing jerk was often, uh, if not always, the, 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 one of the uh, uh, major goals or constraints in human movement. So we apply that by spinning it to turning it into more statistical and combining with essentially uh, this kind of speed actually trade off, rebuilding phase law and generate a, a produced model that can produce large quantitative gestures. Now, we have, once we have large quantitative gestures, we can apply the Let's say, imagine again, you run a gesture typing decoder over real text over longer history. Then you can generate, you can better the language model uh, uh, quality based on this spatial model kind of theory, uh, or vice versa. But here uh, we did the other way around, which arguably is not as valid, but to our knowledge, it's the first application, more modern approach to spatial model. Uh, that is using a neural network with a long short term memory model uh, to do error decoding, so to do the spatial model itself uh, based on the training set generated by this uh, minimum jerk model. In a way, it's kind of a, a chicken egg or kind of self fulfilling prophecy. You can argue that the spatial model, if you feed it with Data that generate back in the model, essentially the model is learning the uh, minimum third model. You can argue that way, but it was the first demonstration of uh, LSTM structure could be used for spatial model uh, modeling. Uh, another challenge in uh, this idea of combining HDI with machine intelligence the, this, uh, uh, is, is, is this very slippery slope of, of speed accuracy trade off. That is, uh, generally, you can always trade precision with time. You spend more time, you do it slowly, you will be more precise, no matter what, what task it is. Uh, and that's essentially what this law trying to reveal. Uh, my colleague, uh, EPR, has been spending about 10 years trying to uh, get to the bottom of this because there's also difficulties that I wouldn't, wouldn't have time to get into detail that I'm also personally involved in. Does this law really review this speed that is trade off? Uh, and there's a yet another level as humans tend to tighten up, can, can subjectively tighten up this trade off curve uh, by just putting more, more effort into it. So here it shows an example of how this effect uh, manifests in a uh, very small scale uh, gesture typing. So this is putting a keyboard on a watch, which seems to be a crazy idea. But the users on one hand slow down so they can give reasonable amount of accuracy to their spatial signal. And the specific decoding, leveraging language model, and the decoding principles I mentioned earlier could just figure out what the user meant. And this is completely, uh, uh, not complete, but somewhat counterintuitive that you can actually just scale the UI. Uh, but the with certain speed actually trade off uh, effect in, in, in it. So, for example, this is more or less the same keyboard. Uh, oops. Uh, 
Okay. This is the same keyboard, essentially the same algorithm. When it's applied to the phone, there's two bars from paper with the triad and the control lock showing it on the phone. But they use the same, essentially the same algorithm, the same like tomorrow when applied to we applied it to uh, no, this is the uh, watch. This is the watch. So 20 some words for me. But the other paper on the phone shows that on average was I don't know, 30 some words per minute or 40 ish, 30, 40 ish, uh, I think high 30s. Uh, but it shows people slow down, but could get more or less the same results as, uh, from error site. Uh, but the another school flaws in, in psychology in HCI is that oh, we just you know, break down the elements into but uh, tap into multiple steps. So there's a, a slew of uh, such efforts or inventions in. Say when you deal with small keyboard, you just put down, tap one last keyboard moves up, and tap another time. So lowering the keeping level to solve the ambiguity problem. And that's that doesn't come close. It's completely different model. You can get a single digit or number of words per minute with those approaches. But this problem can go get to uh, 20 words or higher for Um so uh, now let me uh, go back to the vision of shape writing a little bit. That is, initially, as I said briefly, that the idea is to use shape to fundamentally encode uh, words. But uh, unfortunately, porting is something we have to start with. Uh, initially, I think what we did was on a layout, which is a uh, little better, even though it's not really designed much better, but it, although it, it was not designed for uh, for keyboard. Uh, now, uh, but because of practicality, as people already know, Cordy, we like made it work for Cordy, but then we also get stuff with it. Cordy tend to define shapes all in a similar fashion. Everything's the exact back and forth. Uh, so uh, a few years ago, we can return to this topic like how we can find a new layout for gesture technique that would offer better performance. Better in at least three senses. One is that it's much more clear. So the shapes presented, presented or defined on such a layout would be much more clear. There's much less statistical chance to collide with each other or to be very similar or to be completely the same. Much less intense of that. So we call it clarity on one dimension on this three dimensional chart. And we also want to measure speed because if you only drive the, the uh, optimization process with this clarity metric, it will turn to put uh, common letters on the very edge of the keyboard. So T H E will be very well separated with T O or some, something else uh, because just the larger them will separate their, their distance more. So we also have to put speed back and that become a multi-dimensional uh, optimization problem, which is always challenging. And then yet another dimension that we want people to learn, still learn it. Uh, and we try to find various ways today, later today I'm going to, I know there's some work in here that's very well uh, conducted in terms of measuring people's visual scan or other uh, features to, as, as a cost, as a, as a variables to learning. Uh, we're very much interested in that. Uh, but what we, in our own research I've pursued many, many years, we just couldn't find a magic way of getting a keyboard that's easier to learn, except the simpler quality. The more simpler it is to port it, the better. It's faster it is to learn. Uh, so this three-dimensional plot reflect, reflect the parental front of that process. And then you make a trade-off, essentially a, a somewhat arbitrary decision of this point seems to be both better seems to be the best compromise for clarity and speed and so on and so forth. So this is still ongoing work. We're still not out of it. We are still making progress, but still not out of it. We search for so many different places. Uh, one thing for now to give up is the idea of similarity recording, because we couldn't find a non-linear trade-off. It's almost always a linear trade-off. You gain some by shortening the learning, but you lose some by having a lower upon ceiling. Just couldn't and the latest was idea was uh, I, I proposed this idea of swap I and J key. So it's a very little small amount of change, but it but uh, but it, but it removes lot of ambiguity due to I O U three letters, three vowels, 
very common for English and Java languages, happens to be in the same place on the top right corner of the body. And if you just move the IP down, you separate so many, you, you bring so much better clarity to it. But again, seems to be a good idea, but it still takes time to get used to, and you still have uh, the learning cost, and the, 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 the benefit is, doesn't seem to be worth it. At the subject of that, our data shows it's quite a problem. Okay, I'm just jumping ahead to uh, wrap up this talk by once again reflect on so, where are we going in terms of combining this idea of classic HDI built upon explicit modeling, explicit analytical understanding of human behavior with machine intelligence or machine learning in particular that's increasingly about building more layers of indirection so that the reputation is more latent. Uh, so the uh, so the, it can deal with like all these cross talks all these interactions better because if you divide them into dimensions, it's hard to deal with this interaction effects. Uh, this one result is this. Uh, my colleagues did this feature that's been heavily publicized called Smart Reply. Actually, I looked at my uh, my my email this morning and I saw Anzu writing this email. Gosh, it's not as clear as I hoped. Basically, he said 8.45 a.m. in front of the hotel. Very concise email, very good email. With no history. So smart reply, build this reply from the history. The more history information has, the better. So long email thread, it'll be easier for you to figure out what you want to talk about. But here, you only have one, this email that you can follow with this thread. You skip one, and then the prediction is okay, see you soon. That actually, if I did reply, that offer reply was going to work. Uh, but that also says, uh, have, a, have a safe flight. And the next one is, uh, looks beautiful. It's very interesting too. So this is another one, LST model is predicting. And so I can make some sense, you can reason about it. So why, unlike a classical and grand model, this is something that we're going to be able to do. Uh, but, but also, it's, 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 it's coverage is actually very limited in a way. Uh, and I've been watching my speech colleagues who have tried for many years to build larger models, more direct models. Basically, instead of breaking down uh, ASR into acoustic model versus uh, language model combination, They've been trying to build this direct model to straight from signal to uh, to uh, to output for a long time, and now they seem to be making some breakthroughs just this year, earlier this year. Uh, but the actual the way the model is constructed is not what I initially thought. It's just very direct data mapping, but rather it still has different stages called the listener, attender, spell, very much like one is very similar to. Acoustic model, acoustic model, and that's very uh, similar to uh, language model. And just last week, uh, there's also this debate about machine learning being reaching singularity and all kinds of consequences. Uh, I personally don't feel that's the main challenge, at least not yet. The main challenge is still we need a lot of data, well labeled data, to do well, generally speaking. Uh, so, uh, but nonetheless, my, my company Google put out uh, a set of AI principles last week, which I'm kind of about how AI machine learning should be applied. Uh, sorry, I'm probably taking more time than I, 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 I'm supposed to have. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to open the call for discussion. I can actually start with the question. So, I mean, this session is stolen from uh, Yacht Collective, who's from in the audience over there. In fact, we even reinterpret what, what you meant. So, so he, he was asking for me over email that he considered um, optimizing or, or looking at subjective um, <clears throat> aspects of performance. But let, let's say that I make an error or the suggestion by the uh, work completion is completely out of pace, and you know, it's really frustrating. Or maybe I turn on a feature and I don't notice or um, perceive the, the benefit of an automatic feature. 
you click on them, so you might be losing some benefits because you perceive them, or you might be uh, bumping into customers. That's essentially what a smart reply does. Yeah. It's it's not it actually doesn't use traditional procedural call uh, measures to judge its quality. Mm -hmm. It's also tuned in such a way it doesn't always appear. The trigger rate is relatively low, and it's, it's targeted towards like, some sort of user delight. I have a colleague, uh, you may know, Steve Whitaker said he actually played this game with his wife. That is, he took a, a smart reply, he sent him to write a reply in a style of reply, smart reply, something very stereotypical or exaggerated, because that's what the machine learning mm -hmm. train up. It's a train up the most common replies on common sentences. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in a way, it's, it's about user device, it's about user subjective mm -hmm. benefit. If you actually measure the average, Time performance, it's actually very unclear how much it's saving. Mm -hmm. But but it, it is kind of about that. But the question is that uh, you know, how do you actually uh, you're like integrating these as components or objectives in the in the algorithm? Right, it's more in the selection of these, these right. things. And how do you model these things? But also mostly how do you can come up with data, either in the evaluation sense or in the training sense. Mm -hmm. you know, typically you know, if it's like a matter of thousands, you can still get people to uh, to do it. But uh, when it gets larger scale, if you want to use this big writing system, mm -hmm. like this why the smart reply is as good a feature as it is, it's nowhere like it's not a tech implement. You cannot use it for mm -hmm. writing all emails. Maybe write five percent of email, mm -hmm. but not hundred percent. Mm -hmm. And challenge to keyboard is that it has to work hundred percent of the time. That's, right. That's a good question, good point, yes. And now, do you think that these um, methods that are supposed to support the user um, have that not only in performance but also in cognitive load, or is it more cognitive burden for them? You mean type keyboard in general? The um, method and methods that you presented to support the user in using the keyboard, like the smart reply or the, the, the shape right predictions and all these things. And um, what was the question? You, you... Um, how how it tests them uh, from a cognitive flow oh, okay, perspective? Okay. Yeah, and so I skipped one slide, which is one project, which is actually trying to evaluate these things in terms of the cost and benefit of having either suggestion or prediction. The part that's less controversial is actually machine intelligence has been powering keyboard from the beginning of the mobile era. Like as I said, if you didn't have auto correction. It will be 40% of the work for the error on average. So, but people don't realize that. People only realize that when it's make a false correction. Like when you write something that's OOB, that's not in the dictionary, and you realize, oh, that's not the word I want. You realize its presence when it works. You actually did not know. You were not, like, when you do your studies, you say, well, this is what I typed. This is what I got. What do you mean you typed? You typed, you look at the third touch points or the directory, you typed completely something else. But they think that's what they typed. So, so there's that's always there. But when you make it as a suggestion, you have to usually have to opt in. So that's where uh, people will notice and, and will have a different kind of subject cost. And that's uh, like what we're, the smart reply try to tune in for. Uh, when it, 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 it doesn't trigger, it doesn't have the confidence it even triggers. The hope is that at least it makes sense. It may not be what you want, right? But it makes sense. One more question. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering about the leverage model. So I, I assume most of this is, got, is trained and validated in English. Um, so no, no, uh, no, no. It's, it, it has to be language specific, actually. So That's part of the challenge. It has to be language model training. It has to be language specific. Yeah, absolutely. it's trained. So right. My question is: There are languages such as Finnish mm -hmm. um, that are that have sophisticated inflection. That's extremely context dependent. Yeah. Um, and the adaptive yeah. keyboards that I use on, say, my Apple device every day drives me completely crazy because the prediction just doesn't know the inflections. Is there, and I know this, there, this is sort of an orthogonal question yeah. uh, to the work you're doing because you had a better language yeah. model. Turkish is even more challenging, actually. Uh, is so Turkish is also very challenging, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the problem. I'm, I'm, we have colleagues working on that. Um, it always comes down to, is it uh, some sort of a morphology would, uh, model would make that better, or it's just a larger and grand model? 
a larger vocabulary. That is, it, it in, 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 includes all uh, inflections. So therefore, it's already part of the language model. It's always that classic debate, and it's. I would say I have no Ingram model. Would do it. Would do it. And I also have colleagues who are NLP experts would argue that it's just because most researchers in the U.S. only know English. English is actually an exception. The more inflected languages like Finnish are actually not not exception. They are quite common, and it's an unsolved problem. Thank you. So the last question from Robert. So um, I recently bought an Amazon Alexa Echo, Echo device, and for the first month of using it, um, sort of the of problems. Scottish English is not that compatible with uh, Amazon's uh, speech recognition, at least when it came out in the market. But after a month, it got remarkably better. And talking to, talking to the guys at Amazon, they were saying, oh, it's because basically we put it out and it doesn't really work. But once we've got it out there, we can gather lots of data, build national speech models for that region, and get things working. How easy is it for Google to trade off the privacy of users and get, because you could be getting even, you know, billions of users working <coughs> in, uh, in every region, and also different contextual typing styles and so on. But I understand you've got lots of privacy constraints. So how does your group manage to we actually, you know, always struggle with that. For the longest time, we decided we were not going to do any logging uh, because the privacy intrusion risk. Uh, we know that like, if we personalize the, their model, uh, it would be much better. But uh, if it means it, it means that you may have to go to their long writing history to extract. Uh, language regularities from their own personal style, uh, but that we try to do that now with GDPR. You have to offer ability for users to delete them and you know that. And but offering very detailed UIs actually just from my share point of view, UI design point of view, is impossible mm -hmm. for them to find like a particular sentence in role or message in role that be able to delete and delete all the spatial signals. If we do happen to log spatial signals or that. So we're actually literally you know, redesigning our stack of uh, technologies to accommodate uh, GDPR. Uh, so let's thank uh, Shumin once more. Sorry. And I'm going to introduce the next speaker, who is Perola Christensen from uh, the University of Phoenix and the Department of Engineering. Uh, he's also a fellow of Trinity College in Cambridge and has received a number of public and academic recognitions for his work. Much of the work is actually mentioned by Shimon already. Uh, one of the more, more prestigious ones is the MIT Technology Review under 35 at least. Uh, his talk today is called A Design Engineering Approach for Evolving Interactive Systems. And we're going to hear about robust evidence-based solution principles that are capable of informing the design of interactive systems. And better all, we'll talk about methodology for designing, verifying, and validating interactive systems that's currently designed in engineering. And we'll demonstrate how such an approach can result in robust and versatile solution principles. Right, thank you for the introduction. So this is actually a brand new talk, all for you, version one. So let's see how it goes. And basically what I want to address is something that has been frustrating me for a very long time. And that is my, not only perception, but experience meeting with many companies. And the first thing we ask is, tell us what to do. We don't know how to do things. It's just unbelievable. It's a monumental failure of HCI research to actually result in something that is actionable for building real products. Is this the mic? Uh, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> can, can you hear me back? Yeah, okay. Strange how far is here. So, what? Oh, it's adjustable. So, basically, uh, what I'm trying to address today is uh, my sketch, not complete solution, for how 
to better enable HCI research to directly contribute to next generation HCI products. And the first realization is but what does it actually mean to build a next generation HCI product? Incre increasingly, they are quite complex, as you have heard before. And they will get even more complex if we have augmented reality glasses, etc., that become commonplace. Everything will be fundamentally probabilistic and inferred. And that means different modules and subfunctions will have uh, correlations with each other. So they will, be in, uh, they will not be independent, and they have to be basically constructed with a sense of purpose in relation to each other. And essentially what we then are asking ourselves to do is how do we build a next generation HCI product? It's basically, we're asking the question, how do we actually build a system? So how do we build a system? Turns out we actually know how to build systems. Ask Rolls Royce that make jet engines. We're actually very good at building complex systems. It's not that humans are incapable of building systems. So what is a system? A system is a set of parts. And importantly, there are emerging properties of these parts interacting. So the individual, which is greater than the sum of the individual parts. And HCI products are increasingly becoming very complex systems. So the parts interact with each other. And the relationship between these parts actually determine the overall system function. So how do we actually design systems? So to design systems in, in a traditional engineering sense, it's called systems engineering, and there are actually quite rigorous processes to go about it. However, despite these superficially rigorous processes, at the very, very top level, it does require some creative player. And it essentially involves bringing together two ways of, of thinking. One is to build the right thing, and the other thing is to build the thing right. And I'll address that in a moment. And it requires properties of being both systemic and systematic, okay? So systemic, because we have to plan for the whole life of the system and all aspects of the system and its intended use and context. But also systematic to ensure that every decision is based on sound evidence and reasoning. And also to ensure we can go back to these decisions in case we need to change something in our system design. So very, very briefly, how are products designed? So if it's a kind of a mechanical, electromechanical product, you typically use what's known as the engineering design process, which I will give you an extremely brief uh, and rough sketch about. The step number one is called task clarification. It essentially has two sub-steps. Sub-step number one, arrive at the solution-neutral problem statement. So we have to define what our problem is given our problem context, and we phrase it in solution-neutral terms, avoiding a prescriptive solution. Once we have that, we will somehow arrive at the requirement specification, which is a research discipline on its own right. Having arrived at the requirements, we can now do, do what is known as conceptual design. This means modeling the overall function and sub-functions of the system. Once we've done that, we can then think about how to translate these functions into function carriers. And we can do this by considering many different function carriers, many different combinations of functions. And how do we determine which concept we're actually going to go by? Well, we do concept evaluation. Once we have done that, we repeat this process in a very similar way in what's known as embodiment design. So this is when we arrive at uh, circuit drawings, uh, we write code, etc. And in the end, we arrive at what's known as detail design, which essentially for a mechanical system would be manufacturing instructions. Finally, having arrived at the complete system, we then undergo verification and validation. So verification means going through every requirement and ensuring that it has been fulfilled. It doesn't guarantee you have built the right thing. It just guarantees that you have built the thing right. To know what you have built the right thing, you have to actually do validation, which we are quite familiar with in HCI. And typical ways of doing this would be to actually test it, sell it, if people actually buy it, A-B test it, compare it against another competitor, et cetera. I don't propose we should do this, but this is just background. Then this is, of course, highly simplified, because if you're actually doing this for a real product, you will know that managing risk is the key success indicator for any product design. Anticipating and managing risk is essential and that goes hand in hand with what's known as change management, changing requirements and circumstances where you have to do rework as part of your design. So some background on that. So what we're doing in HCI is really focusing on validation a lot, actually. I'll get back to that. And that is 
I call this short circuit A-B testing, and it really is the curse of HCI, unfortunately, and HCI innovation. Um, the problem with current HCI research, in my opinion, which is basically doing interaction techniques, is this short circuit A-B testing, right? The system itself is very rarely explicitly more, right? The overall function of the system is poorly articulated. If it's articulated at all, typically not. Well, these are really uncomfortable. <laughs> and sub-functions, right? When you break down the overall function into sub-functions, are not made explicit. And what happens as a result of this is that basically people, people try to build a complex system on their own. So they think about some idea, right? They look at existing things that are out there. They think of some idea. They cook up a somehow semi-working complex system that doesn't really work, but it's good enough to do A-B testing. Basically, compare, I put my little ID into an existing system that I cobbled together, and then an A-B test against a benchmark, maybe an existing system. If there is a statistical significant difference, I cannot claim that my little, little contribution here is actually a significant contribution and should be valued in the community. So I think sometimes this actually works, but frankly, I believe often it's by sheer accident, actually. It's not really, it really shouldn't work, but somehow it still does. There are three problems with this short circuit A-B testing approach. So one, it doesn't actually tell us how to build new systems. It doesn't really give us genuine insight into how to build new systems because it fails to articulate and provide evidence, right, for the mechanism itself, right, that is actually making a contribution to the system success. It has poor generalization as it's tied to a particular embodiment, typically something people have cobbled together with a poor language model, etc. I may not generalize to a real product that you would actually try to build. It is often also linked to current trends. Microsoft releases the Microsoft Kinect. Suddenly everybody is doing gesture recognition in 3D gestures, right? Because now it's easy. Before it was very, very hard to do. The third problem is that there are lots of ideas, and this is the biggest problem actually, there are lots of ideas and lots of really difficult topics that are not properly studied because you cannot do short circuit A-B testing to evaluate the merits of these ideas. It's integral to the success of a complex system, but on its own, it's very, very difficult to test these ideas. I believe adaptive language modeling is actually an excellent example of this. It's very, very difficult to test the merits of adaptive language modeling, which is a, an idea that should obviously work, right, and provide huge benefits. That's very, very, very difficult to do the short circuit A-B testing approach and demonstrate the merits of these ideas. And I believe there's a lot of these ideas. This is just one obvious example that I think comes across to me very strongly. I think there are lots of other assorted ideas that are never properly explored because of this need to have a great story in a research paper and then to provide an evaluation, right, conclusive evidence, which leads to this short circuit A-B testing. So can we think about it a little bit different? So nothing here would be completely original. It would be surprising if it would be. But I basically cobbled together various ideas into an approach I think is actually much more productive. So the number one step in my approach is to formulate a solution-neutral problem statement. I'll talk about that in a moment exactly how to do that. This is also very useful for PhD students, actually, to arrive at a central research hypothesis. The second step is to identify the function structures by doing functional modeling. Identifying the functions by your system and the sub-functions your system is trying to achieve. The third and crucial step is to translate these functional elements in your functional model into function carriers. And how do you do that? How do you actually take an abstract function and actually turn it into an embodiment? Well, you apply a solution principle some sort of design principle, either by evidence or experience or something else, but tells you this is a good way of translating a functional element into a function carrier. Having done this, we can then carry out verification and validation. And if it comes to a contribution in terms of a solution principle, it may be sufficient to do verification. A validation is really for an entire system or a module, right? You can still make a strong contribution if you can just verify that your solution principle is sensible. Now, having done this, we can reuse working solution principles for further problems. And indeed, another contribution can simply be the functional modeling. You can, and I will show you examples of this later in this talk. A contribution can be that, like, hey, you know, there are different sub-functions we should consider. Here's a sub-function that should be added. 
And that alone can be a very worthy contribution in my mind. Step one, formulation of a solution neutral problem statement. Very easy to do, almost never done. It's amazing to me, basically. Every time uh, I'm asked to be an opponent or something similar, I ask people, what's your central research hypothesis? And people are like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> don't ask that. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it really should be fundamental. Right? It's fundamental. Like, what are you trying to do? And a solution to the problem statement is the same. If you're trying to build a system, what is the system? What's the problem? What's the problem you are trying to solve? <laughs> Amazing you how for people to articulate this. And solving the wrong problem is very, very common, as we see all the time in failed products and most research that doesn't really matter. So it's wise to spend some time contemplating what is the problem we are actually trying to solve. And a great way to do this is to arrive at a solution neutral problem statement, which, as the name suggests, avoids framing the problem in solution-defined terms. And moving up and down the abstraction levels of the solution neutral problem essentially configures how much of the source space you are searching. So a useful technique here is to raise the level of abstraction. I'll show you an example of something you're all familiar with, a law model. A typical problem statement from an engineering company might be like who's quarm, something like that. Design a one kilowatt lawnmower to replace last year's 300 millimeters cylinder model. It must be powered by mains electricity, weigh no more than 10 kilograms, let the cut and drive in operation. So this is obviously not a solution to a problem statement. But if you think about it in ACI and a lot of Kai papers that are you're reading, this is actually the kind of problems people are often considering. You can change this statement, though. You can make it more solidical. You can do it by successive abstraction. We can say, replace last year's model. We can go further down the abstraction, right, an increased abstraction, and say, design a lawnmower. We can change it to a, create a device to cut grass, essentially like a robot cutting grass instead, right? And we can even say, device a means of keeping the grass short, which opens the design space for further things like chemical solutions, for instance, to make force the grass to stay short. We can go even to an absurd level of abstraction and say, well, let's just think about keeping the garden pleasant, however we might do, that, might do that. So it's very easy to arrive at a solution to a problem statement, and I, I, believe, I think it's very, very, very useful to do so. And step two. So now we know the problem we're trying to solve in solution neutral terms. So how do we actually model our system? So we need to identify the function structures. And you can do this by functional model. You determine the overall function. That's task clarification, which we have sort of already done. We try to figure out what we're trying to solve. By establishing function structures, elaborating on the functional design, I will show an example of that in a moment. Once we have done that, we can then generate and select among suitable combinations and identify trade-offs in our design and explore the design space. So, we have an overall function, we have some inputs and we have some outputs. Typically, the inputs that are always there, no matter what you do, are energy, materials and signals. In HCI, we are typically talking about signals. Outputs of this overall function is, again, going to be energy, materials and signals. And there is a boundary of our technical system, what we're actually choosing to consider. Everything we're choosing to consider should be inside a box. So, one example is a pulse meter. There's energy control and settings going in, and there's energy and status going out. We have on-off, right, to turn it on and off. There's energy, heat, noise, light. We have status, on-off, battery status, for instance, like lens indicators. We can then take this overall function and break it down into numerous sub-functions. Of course, they should be clear, consistent, and complete. And we can here think about energy, control, processes, and refine the interactions between our overall sub-functions of our design. So, our little pulse meter again. We have energy control and settings going in. We have waste energy output and status going out. And I have identified the following sub-functions in this cartoon example. And then we can consider the flow of signals uh, and energy in the system. Very easy to do, actually. And I'll show you how useful this can be in ACI as well in a moment. Having done this, though, we have identified our functions. Now, how do we actually implement anything? Right? Everything is extremely theoretical and cheap and cheerful. Everything is very easy to change at this state, stage, right? We consider our sub-functions, right? 
supply energy, measure poles, display reading, etc. And we consider different solutions, right? Different ways of translating these functions into function carriers. So who can supply the energy? Can be the human, can be a battery, can be solar. Who can make, what, what can we do to measure the poles? And there's various sensor ways of doing that. How do we display the reading? There are various ways of displaying feedback to the user. We can then choose combinations. And we can choose a combination, I call it combination one. We can then also think about the weightings here, right? So basically, if we have some sort of value as a function of quantity, we can assign a value, right, to the goodness of each function carrier. So if we're considering, for instance, battery life, weight, accuracy, and sensing, etc., for every function carrier we're considering, we can score it. And the scoring functions can be linear, and they can be nonlinear, right? Depending on experience. And good contribution can even be just simply understanding the envelope of a scoring function. At the end, we will arrive at some sensible concepts. They will have some values and some weighted values. And we will arrive at, we can see it as linear combinations, and you get different scores. And the instinct is to pick the one with the best score, but actually, obviously, this requires judgment and a narrative and some sort of logical reasoning for us to show some concept. The real sum contribution in ACI can even be done in this stage. Yes, analyzing the function structures of what we're trying to do. Even a simple text input system can be broken down in this way, right? And there can be contributions there. But the big contributions are actually in step three, translating functional elements to function carriers. So a functional element, right, is a solution to a function in a functional model. A function carrier is an embodiment, right? It carries out the function. A solution principle is a design principle, a design guide, but tells us how do we actually translate the function into a function carrier. And I would argue these solution principles are the last ACI research contributions, but are, can be hugely valuable for years to come, maybe hundreds of years to come, right? Because they collectively make it possible to understand how do we best translate complex function structures, right, into actual embodiments. So they can be very, very low level, a very specific subfunction, or they can talk about uh, interaction of subfunctions. Or we can talk about how to translate an overall function in some way. For a solution principle to be useful, however, it needs to make it clear what the function is. What is the function we're trying to solve? It also must make it clear which function carries our intended. Using a touch screen versus a depth sensor are two different sensor types. The same solution principle may not apply. And it also has to provide evidence of robustness, right? That it actually works. This does not necessarily mean A-B testing, right? Sometimes this is A-B testing, sometimes this is just logic. And sometimes it's, it's by going into MATLAB and simply plotting a heat map and looking at the envelope. Step four for completeness, before I actually show ACI examples, verification and validation. So verification means ensuring we're satisfying all the requirements, or we're building the system right. A validation process assesses whether we actually built the right system. Verification actually is very interesting because I think it applies a lot to evaluating the usefulness of solution principles. Typical verification methods, the four main ways of ver engaging in verification is inspection, so non-destructive examination of the system, like visual inspection, demonstration, you check that it does its intended purpose, Testing, you, you feed predefined inputs and you check that you get the expected outputs. Or analysis, which could be, for instance, investigating performance envelopes by plotting heat maps in MATLAB or doing sophisticated mathematical modeling. For instance, if you use an asthmatic inhaler, the fluid mechanical models are actually quite detailed and they are, they are assessed in their verification process by means of analysis. All these aspects, I think, are fair game for ensuring that a, that, that, a, that, a, that, a, that a solution principle can be verified. Validation, I don't have to talk about because we do that a lot in ACI. It's called evaluation, right? Basically, we build something, we A-B test it. If it's slightly better than the competition, we have a great story and we publish. The outcomes of my proposal is that we actually get, number one, clearly articulated functional models of what we're actually trying to build. So that alone would actually make things a lot clearer what we're trying to do. Almost never currently done at the moment. 
We will also get a set of robust solution principles for how we actually translate the major sub-functions into function carriers. And even though we may not actually build the next exciting HCI product, now HCI research can actually contribute a lot to actual HCI product design. Not only that, it's very easy for HCI research to actively contribute to next HCI products by identifying the function structures and thinking about the solution principles that are realizing the functions as function carries and how that can be improved. Now, I'm not saying none of this is not done at the moment. Of course it is, but it's not articulated in a systematic way. That's the contribution. That's what I'm trying to get people to think about. So I have some example. My first example is smartwatch typing. What Shumi forgot to mention uh, when he talked about watch writer paper is that a year before, a year before they published their note at Kai, we published a 10-page paper at Kai, which basically, basically made the point that you don't need to be very creative when you want to type on a smartwatch. You can just make the keyboard really, really tiny, let people type as usual, and frankly, it works fine. Right? No need to do anything else, right? So sometimes it's okay to be, you know, to be uh, boring, right, if you're smart about it. To make that point, I have this cartoon illustration. Some of you have seen this before, performance as a function of time. We have a familiar interface, let's say an Android keyboard. The performance as a function of time will be constant because we already know about the type using it. We are unlikely to improve. We have some unfamiliar interface. We want to show some sort of benefit or at least the same, same performance. There is a crossover point when these lines cross. That's the time invested by the user for your system, right? And as long as we're below, right? As long as we're to the left of, of that uh, dashed line there, we're actually asking the user to invest money in the vain hope of eventually getting a benefit, right? So you don't want to be there for too long. Why would you want to do this? Well, just like buying stocks on the stock market, you hope for a performance benefit, right? And of course, it might look like this, there's a very tiny performance benefit, or if it's mobile text entry, it probably looks like this. It's actually much worse than you should use. So, typing on a smartwatch, this is something I convinced my collaborator Keith to do. He was very negative against it. I think it's almost comedy work, to be honest. I don't believe in typing on a smartwatch. I, I just don't see the point. And if you do it, I would imagine you type very little. But I saw many Kai papers with very, very naive ideas. Basically, allow, asking the user to invest huge amounts of training in learning some particular system that they're almost never going to use. And the eventual benefit is actually net negative compared to the system they're already using. So you can obviously do many naive things like progressive zooming. You type on the keyboard, it zooms in. You type again, it zooms in, whatever, right? When the key is big enough for you to hit, you hit the key, and then it zooms out, and you repeat. Obviously slow and frustrating. You can reduce the key set and do some sort of coding keyboard where you push multiple keys to get a letter. It takes like 40 hours of dedicated practice to be good at. If you're willing to have the patience to do that, you can probably get 40 per minute. Or you can have various multiple stroke uh, things like you know playing a Nintendo game, left, right, up, down, left, right, it gives you a letter or something like that, and you have to learn all these combinations. Nobody wants to do this, there's zero evidence, nobody has ever wanted to do this. They're all slow, all demand user learning, and essentially are complete failures and a waste of time. So back to this crossover point illustration. So we have the familiar interface, the Android keyboard, we have a new smartwatch map method. Let's think about something that can actually be competitive with an Android keyboard maybe a coding keyboard, that would take about 40 hours of dedicated practice, I would imagine, to get good at. So that's 40 hours of dedicated practice, assume the use of types for five minutes on their smartwatch every day, okay? That's the use of performance after months of use down there. And after 480 days, they reach the crossover point. Point being that even, even though there might be a net benefit, right, and there might be a crossover point, in reality, you may not actually even reach it. So what we did here instead is we said, let's just make the keyboard really tiny, and that's about it, right? You make it really tiny, you ask people to type, and that's about it. So we do a Bayesian inference, so we fix two degaussions on the keys. It turns out the likelihood model, the touch model doesn't really matter if you have a good language model. So you can get away with a very simple model here. And we basically compute a posterior distribution, which is going to be, so if you max that posterior distribution, it's going to be proportional to the likelihood model the touch model times the language model, the prior. The language model here is based on Twitter. It turns out Twitter is useful for something. It's very good at predicting mobile text. And the, the touch model is just 2D Gaussians. And then we do some decoding. I've spared you the slide because I didn't want to take up too much time. Then we do some testing here. 
So we have a normal small and a tiny keyboard. And it turns out you can type really fast on a tiny keyboard. Yes, you get high character error rates for a really tiny keyboard, but if you let users type even further, which this chart is not showing, that error rate goes down dramatically with experience. Lesson being, there's no need to be in innovative here in the UI layer. Just keep the same thing, make it really tiny, and you're fine. Now, what does this have to do with what I said before? So, why is this design in here? First of all, everything here is retrofitted, because I just thought of this talk, right? And this research was done four years ago. But the overall function here is type text, right? With a couple of additional constraints. Form factor, minimal learning. Solution principle for, for translating type text to a function carrier, right? It's basically respect path dependency, right? People don't want to learn anything new. Quirky take a very long time to learn. I'm going to skip the debate about optimized keyboard and all of that thing and say, let's just use the quirky. Which leads to the following sub-functions, actually. Type inferred text. That's a new sub-function we are now created, right? In our function structure. Which then again needs additional sub functions. Sense key press, infer letter, present infer text, display output. And then we did verification and validation. What I didn't tell you is we actually checked the display, the, the present infer text uh, sub function. We, for instance, noticed that it's okay to present intermediate text, even though we will auto correct it to something else. So we do that, it doesn't feel the performance. We did very verify the space element, right? How do you actually do spacing between the words? Should you allow users, must users hit the space bar? Can they skip hit to the space bar or should they swipe left or right? In the final system, we actually found using experimental modeling, it doesn't matter. You can use machine whatever the limit you want and the statistical decoder can just figure it out. So we verify that as well. Finally, we validated the design. You can type faster using the system with a total tolerable error rate. So what is the actual output here? Is it that we can type on a smartwatch? in a tiny screen using this specific algorithm and training a language model on Twitter? No, that is not the lasting impact, right? It's a refined solution principle, right? You can go from the, the overall function type text to type infer text, right? And minimize user learning and still go to a smaller form factor. That is what we should remember from this work. Second case study, user-regulated uncertainty. This is actually with uh, Daryl, which we might may, may, may not be in the audience here, probably not. Basically, this is about autocorrect track, right? Ah, you're here. So so you have to go in front here and present this. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is basically what people call the autocorrect track, or at least Daryl called it autocorrect track. I don't think I've heard it before, but basically autocorrect is great when it works, and not so great when it doesn't work, when it's frustrating as hell, right? And we actually did a survey, so we presented users with, with Word, with, with basically typing, and we said basically ask the user, will this be non-autocorrected or will this be autocorrected? And people rated it between one and five, will definitely be corrected or will not be corrected. As you can see from the distributions here, people aren't that bad at guessing whether a word will be autocorrected or not, right? So that really um, lends itself to the observation that users, since we are good at anticipating whether, whether things will be autocorrect or not, to give users the agency, the control, right, to basically preempt incorrect autocorrect. So how do you give users that agency? Well, the way we did it, there are many ways of doing this. I'm not saying this is the best way, probably isn't. You can have a pressure sensitive touch, screen, right? So the harder you push the keys, the more you spike these two dimensional Gaussians on the particular key. That is essentially telling the statistical decoder I really, really believe in this letter that I'm pushing super hard at, right? Don't flip the letter, right? If you push really hard on these keys, you don't actually have to push that hard. If you push harder on these intended keys that you really want not to be changed, the system is unlikely to change. That is essentially what we did. Does it work? Yes, it does actually, right? It improved entry rate by 20%, and the amount of direct corrections that users are doing is dropping, was dropping by 10%. Very, very simple thing. No, it's not really about that paper. It's about how does this fit into what I was telling you before. Well, what is the overall function we're investigating here? Type inferred text. We have some additional constraints. Minimal learning, provide users with agency, right, or control. With the following new sub-function, right, we can introduce that. Provide user control of uncertainty. Now the question is, of course, how do we translate that function into a function carrier? We did it by pressure. There are other ways of doing it. You can do it by time duration, or, I don't know, speaking to it, or slapping the phone, lots of stuff you can do, right? So there's very many ways of translating this function. So there are two contributions of this work. Number one, we refine the functional modeling of how to type on an autocorrect keyboard. 
we said, actually, there is another sub function you should consider. And number two, we gave a solution principle for how to translate this sub function into a function carrier. I think this way of thinking about things is much more productive, particularly now when ACI products are becoming increasingly complex with sensing, advanced sensing, machine learning, etc. It's becoming increasingly difficult to do the naive short circuit AB testing approach. Right? And no man is an island, right? But we are a lot of researchers across the world, right? We can build a system indirectly by basically understanding the functional model and by understanding the solution principle for translating these functions into function carriers. And I basically said my last slide there. So that's about it. Thank you. Could you speculate a little on, so what if you undertook big research projects with, from the start of this methodology? What's, uh, what's sort of the great big future we'll, we'll end up with uh, if we do that? I actually think this is going to be necessary. So I truly believe augmented reality glasses with a great form factor like my glasses is going to be the future. If that's the future, we can forget about our mobile phones. They just passed it, right? Then everything is suddenly uncertain. Even on a touch screen, you're fairly certain you hit a specified icon or a specified button. In this future, though, everything is inferred, right? It's going to be a combination of speech and 3D gesturing, right? And 3D touch. So that means that model is very, very complex. Nobody is basically going to build that model from scratch. This is where, where you really want to do a complete functional model and think about how to realize these functions into function carriers depending on the sensor and the form factor. So it's these kind of things that drove me to this, actually. And the frustration of like zero impact of CAI papers in industry, right? Makes sense. Nice. There was another question. Uh, how do we go, uh, first we have the artifact, and maybe we have the function. And how can we go from artifact to function? I'm just thinking of, for example, this flow more over, uh, we just, like uh, we can think of it as a kind of tool to keep the garden neat, but we can also think of it as something that uh, maybe helps the owner show how fancy of a kind of uh, tool he has with all the motor and power. Yeah, that's directly captured so, by this. That's directly captured by this. You can create a function for that. Absolutely. That's what companies do. Yeah, but right? you know, like, uh, at that point, we also introduce some kind of bias at least from our perspective. So of course, kind of good for us because we have the whole picture. Well, there can be different functional models, right, for similar problems, right? We, we don't have to agree on our functional models. We can have different functions and we can have different priorities. My point being, when you identify solution principles, they are very likely to apply to different people's functional models. That's the power of it, right? So it's not tied to your cobbled together system, which just happens to work a little bit better once, right? So you got your kite paper out of it, but it can't really help anybody else but one of that. But here, if you're thinking about solution principles for translating your functions into function carriers, they may still be better about that. They may still have to be investigated again, but at least we are specified, right? At least we are formalized, so we can use it. So it doesn't stop at innovation whatsoever. No, on the contrary, you can do whatever you want. That was another. Question by Rod, I think. Yeah, I was just going to ask because you were, you were specifying the, I think it was in your previous slide, you had all the different bits of the solution, and you know, you don't touch on the that. Um, how do you think we can make it easier to share working software? Because one of the things that we talked about in like machine learning in the next slide is what's really impressed me that the new way of machine learning is. It's very easy to share frameworks, to share networks. Yeah, to that's work. a great point. So the first starting point, so that's, that's, I think, is in the immediate future very useful. The lasting impact, though, will be the solution principles and the function models. They will last forever. Software will change because it goes stale. But I would say this, if we can change to this kind of way of thinking, it's much easier to share code, right? Because you can share code specific for realizing certain solution principles, for instance. I think keyboard is a difficult one. Uh, 
They may or may not be coming out of the toolkit about that, actually. But it's a difficult one because it's quite complex, frankly. I mean, it's like speech recognition. It's just a lot of work and a lot of things that has to work. A lot of practical, not really interesting research work that has to be implemented to make it work, which make, makes it difficult to release because it's just so difficult to actually use it. It's a bit like pocket speak, which is an open source speech recognizer. You still have to be a speech recognition expert to actually use it. I think, so keyboards is a difficult case, I would say. For most, most systems, it's easier to release things. And I think releases can be tied to this translation, again, of function carriers into, function elements into function carriers. That's another question. You talk about verification and validation of the outcome. Um, but, and then you try to generalize the solution principles, but can you somehow also validate those solution principles? Yes, really you can. Them? So sometimes it makes sense to validate the solution principle, but often it does not. Often it's fine to just verify it. Verification is a good thing, right? Everything doesn't have to be A-B testing, right? It's okay not to do an SPCS clickety click, right? And do the F distribution thing, right? It's about, if you can have a good, good argument for your solution, but this is a great way of translating my function into a function carrier. That's okay, right? That may be A-B testing, but it may be something completely different. It could be mathematical modeling. And sometimes it doesn't even work. I work with disabled users, like severely multiple disabled users, and I get these comedy questions I have to discuss with PhD students who are coming from that field. I mean, like, we want to publish a Kai paper, but we don't have 60 disabled people with a particular disability. It's like, it's crazy. I say, like, no, no, that's not how you do it, right? You model this, right? You can mathematically model how we are typing, and then you can see, and that model will be individual for every disabled user, but you can still search see an impact in the model parameters. And that's how you have to do it. You can't A-B test this. It doesn't make any sense. And I think there's a lot of instances it just does not make sense. I have nothing against A-B testing per se, except the insistence of A-B testing everything, which I call short-circuit A-B testing, right? Just short-circuit the entire design process and go straight to A-B testing. A-B testing should really only be done when you're once you're satisfied with a complex system, right? That's when you do the validation, right? Before then, you undergo some form of verification. And there are many ways of doing that. So if I can summarize, you are particularly bothered by um, kind of novelty-driven research in high in particular ways um, that, that you call it HCI, and that's the problem. But the real HCI world is there such a thing. Almost I like, you pay no attention to this. Um, like companies like Google or Apple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't pay attention to what happens. To, because it's unusable. But, but because yeah. the public, because the academic metrics are different, the incentives are different. The incentives are measured by the public population, uh, and uh, where novelty for novelty's sake is given a high a premium. That is, it, it's novelty in the sense, I did something nobody else has done, even though it's a, actually uh, might be a bad idea, but it's, it's a new idea, therefore it's more likely to be published. So the publishing metric in there. Yeah, but, but, but that seems to be the, what you're mostly criticizing. No, no, well, that's that's an unfortunate side of it, but that happens in every piece. You can go to the niche, right? And it's so that was my question. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's pervasive in all these things, right? I'm not saying anything is particularly wrong in ACI. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is everything, even novelty driven ACI, could be much more useful if it's phrased like this. Because now we get something actionable out of it that applies beyond a narrow system. That's the power of the method, right? You can still do novelty, right? You can change the function more. You can think of different ways of translating a function element to a function carrier. A lot of people are doing this, but they're not thinking about it in a systematic enough way, which means the results end up being useless to the industry. Right? Unless you're truly an expert, I'm extremely well read, I can sort of guesstimate what they were trying to do, but that's not how it should be. So I think it could be, people should still do that, they are free to do that. Just like Hellman Hess wrote the, you know, the glass bead game, right? about this fantasy world where people play this magical game of synthesis of mathematics and music, right? And that's, you get credit for being more and more clever in this completely pointless enterprise, right? I'm, I'm okay with all of that, right? But let's just make it, you know, more formalized so we actually know what we do, so we can identify proper mechanisms. I think text input is actually good at doing this, but frankly, by sheer accident, not really by design. There was another question. I think the, one of the other things is A-B testing. And it's being done without a formal modeling framework can often be completely pointless. So how did you pick? You've got this huge design space with potentially thousands of managers. 
how did you pick in the if you haven't got the technical approach to use it, you've got a, a formal model and you're, you, you've already done some serious thinking about the space you're in and then making something. Better. Exactly. That's actually one of the points I'm trying to make in this talk, but I probably didn't do it clearly enough, right? That means this naive A-B testing, right, is, 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 is meaningless because it's just not clear what are the points A and B, as yeah, you say. Yeah. And a good example is language modeling. Like in text input, there are so many papers showing, oh, we can see some benefit. But then you look at the language model, and the language model is horrible. That means this work, it may show a benefit, maybe not, I do not know. Probably not, actually. Because in my experience, a really good language model will swamp pretty much anything else. So it was understandable. I'm very happy about this. This is iteration one. Any other feedback, feel free to email me. I will be very happy to do that. Okay. So there are like two camps, be smart first or be smart after the fact, right? And then you're with the be smart first camp, and I'm actually there with you, and also quite the same time. Um, if you look at the history of ACI, uh, many of the, the, the scholars like Stu, Stu Carter, they think influence from Herb Simon and Francis Twitty at the JBL, and you know, they started with a very similar approach, you know, the morphological approach to ACI. And all that. But then they somehow lost the game. And, and one of the reasons is we're dealing with very complex, these are not normal engineering problems and normal uh, complex systems, but they're socio technical. This is what I like, you know, what people tell me. And even, even a, a communication device like a keyboard, you, know, you communicate, humans are communicating with each other. So one error for one person might be, mean something completely different to somebody else. And this is something that makes it really hard to pre specify those, those functions and requirements you know, upfront. You have to go back at the very beginning and, and redo the work, and that's and that's and I'm, I'm well with you. And that's why people slip to this very efficient-looking, you know, after-the-fact mode, right? Because you get if I, if I have to do uh, a text into device now, I can just do the AB uh, short circuit approach right now, and in a week I have something, right? Whereas if I take your approach, it takes uh, you know months or years. Okay, so two things about that. One is. Actually, that's just ignorance, right? Oh, we designed, but what about the interaction constants? We're not considering that. Think about asthmatic inhalers. I had a colleague who actually did this, right? Do we don't consider the context? Let me let me tell you, they are definitely considering the interaction context, right? You say people with disabilities, different ways of holding it, different breathing difficulties, different cultures, the whole entire manufacturing pipeline, the safety of the dosage, that you actually get the right dose inhale. All of these things are considered, right? So it's very possible to use an engineering design process and take the interaction context into place. That's number one. Number two is this kind of like we need to do things easy, right? The three month type paper. You can still do it easy using my method. You can still get your three month type paper with minimum work. Tell me how. You basically discover solution principles, right? And you basically focus on one solution principle, right? You, you, you got a robust evidence for that. So you can still do things very incrementally, very small. And sometimes that's actually a good thing. So I don't think, you know, you don't actually have to be doing that. You don't have to model the entire system. Like I said, I've been using different terminology, but thinking very, very similar way. And it's so sad that we have to remind the community of the way to, way to do the work. Yeah. You know, this is 2018 and we, you know. <laughs> but hey, thank you, Beryl. Thanks. <laughs>
the communication channel. So you're, um, you've got information in the human mind, they've got some intention, and they're trying to communicate that with um, the computer. So and you view that as a channel that has certain noise characteristics that are accumulations, the different elements of how you communicate with the system. A different perspective would be to say you've got a human and a computer and they're trying to control each other, hopefully in a way that gets them to fulfill the human's aims. So the human has some intention, they have vectors, so in Carola's case he's got his finger uh, sliding away on the keyboard. Um, you have the capacitive sensors on the device sensing that the computer is changing its state and feeding back some of that information to the user, which they perceive with their eyes, or if it's tactile, they'll have their haptic senses, and they try and work together with the machine to achieve some joint goals. Another perspective might be to view it as an inference challenge, that the human has some intention, and that's unknown to the computer, and the computer has to observe the behavior from the human in such a way as to infer properly what is the human intention. And each of these will have value and can be used in a formal um, approach. Uh, but I think if you only view it from one perspective, you're probably going to be missing opportunities to improve your system. Um, and even when you think about the, the communication approach, in order to communicate, you have to use control. So you have to control your body. You've got your human intention intertwined with the properties of the control that was used to generate that information. So you have to get your arm to, towards the keyboard, you have to hit a key precisely. You'll be getting feedback from the screen, you'll be getting tactile feedback from the keyboard. Um, and there's going to be time and dynamics of the interface and of your sensations. So even if you take a communication approach, ignoring the control aspect is probably going to damage your understanding of what's going on. And often the purpose of communication with the computer is to control some element of the world. Uh, you want your car to go from A to B, you want your heating system to achieve a particular temperature, so that sometimes you are controlling objects in the environment. So if we develop this human-computer um, interaction loop and think about how have humans been doing things in the past, so you could argue 30,000 years ago, Humans were just using their bare hands to engage with the world. So it's pure modulated muscle power that was affecting variables in the environment. Um, we then went to using tools, we developed knives and so on, and we started to improve our performance by having a tool. We then started to control power sources like wind or steam and bring them into our control tasks. So that would cover you until uh, basically the last century. And now we've got the potential to insert computational power, machine learning, AI, pick your latest trendy description of what's going on. And I find this structure diagram quite a useful way of trying to understand the different ways in which uh, computational elements like machine learning and AI can fit into the way humans engage with the world. So the grey boxes in this are now where we have computational augmentation. So for example, you might have a uh, computer trying to perceive the human intent. So that might be a kinetic sensor that's picking up the bodily pose and analysing the gestures that you're generating in order to communicate with the device. And uh, Anna yesterday was presenting hand gestures with a leap motion device that would communicate symbols. So that could be that first box. That then passes on to the next element, which is how we actually act on the world. So this might be something that's controlling your semi-autonomous or autonomous car. Uh, so it's something that's acting on the world, and you might do something with intelligent uh, augmentation there. That changes the world, that changes the system that you're trying to engage with. You then have computational perception of the environment. Now that might be being able to perceive the world at a, bit, a wavelength that's not visible to humans. It might be doing things at a speed that is faster than humans can work at. 
It might be distributed over a wide area, but the computer can perceive the system that you're trying to control, perceive its state, and then use that for either feeding back into the computation of the control, or it can feed back to you in some form of augmented display that makes your task easier. So you're trying to achieve some goal together with the computational support, and it can do some of that for you, or it can feed back to you augmented information that helps you better understand the systems that people found already back in the, the 50s and 60s. Submarines were really difficult to control, but if you presented the information in the right way to the um, steersman in the submarine, you could simplify their task, make them able to achieve high performance with less training. Um, so that, that's a, a useful structure diagram to bring in whenever you're trying to understand um, what you can do with computational power. And I'll give a number of examples in the talk where we infer human action via uh, sensing systems and using machine learning for that, inferring subjective elements of uh, musical content, and augmenting our ability to sense the environment at different wavelengths. But as a bit of uh, background, one of the things that we've often seen in interaction design has been that people have assumed that one of the goals was to get users fully engaged always doing things on the device, really paying attention to their, um, their mobile phone. And while that happens some of the time, it's often not possible or appropriate. So on the top left, you can imagine how well that data is going. The, the man is spending all his time looking at his mobile device instead of paying attention to the person he should be paying attention to. And she's not too impressed. It might be that you're temporarily um, encumbered by other Devices, you might be carrying a baby, you've got luggage, you can't use the particular devices which would otherwise be quite accessible. Or you might be cognitively just tired at the end of a long day, you can't be bothered. You would like things to be done for you. So what we'd like to do is to come up with ways in which we can allow what we call casual interaction. You're loosening the reins um, in your collaboration with your machine so that at times you can get automated systems to do things for you, and other times you remain in control. And part of the motivation for this is that we're becoming, we're carrying mobile devices with us every moment of our day. We're being faced with companies who are being extremely focused at using platform and conditioning to keep us rewarded, keep us coming back. There are design technologies, uh, design approaches like uh, Mir and I's hooked um, approach where they create models that are explicitly about bringing you back in, engaging you consistently. You've got these context dependent prompts that can work out what reinforces you and they can keep reinforcing you until you behave like a skinner pigeon. So if we don't give ourselves a way of decoupling at times from the system, we're going to become more and more like skinner's pigeons. And the question of who's controlling who in this context is going to be quite interesting. So, one of the things we're interested in is can we look at a focused, co casual continuum of how you can engage with devices and allow people to move around them at different times? So, you can have this stratified interaction where you have different layers and styles of interaction where at times, if you're not generating the bits, if you're not paying attention to the control, that's the bits of information have to come from elsewhere. And that's often going to be from machine learning models. It's going to be looking at what you usually do in this context or what people like you do in this context. And that's going to take some load off you, but it's also taking some control and power away from you. But that might be appropriate if it's letting you apply your attention and your focus to other things which matter more at that moment. And this is related to uh, fast work uh, in um, interactive systems. So the Flemish paper from 2003 was looking at what's called the H metaphor, and it was about intelligent cockpit uh, automation. How does a pilot engage with an intelligent uh, autopilot? And he's arguing that you should think about this as more like horse riding, that you have tight rein control and loose rein control. If you've got tight rate control, then you have got to pay more attention. You've got to be more prompt in your control inputs, but you have full control. If you have loose rate control, you've delegated some authority, some autonomy to the system. 
And this can become quite important for special use cases like disabled users. So we have a European project, the Warcraft project, where we're looking at how could you augment the environment of our spinal cord in your patient. And don't worry, we didn't flood the users with all the sensors here that are showing the different possibilities. But the particular project was to do functional stimulation of the nerves and the arms so that we could re-establish re grasping behavior. But there are different types of grasp and they would be dependent on the type of object that you were controlling and the, um, the state of your muscles at that moment. So we could look at simplifying the task by embedding the Bluetooth sensors into the objects in the environment so that if I got my arm close enough to an object, we could use the right grasp. We have an option for a brain computer interface which gives the users full control, but is um, takes effort to use and can be unreliable. So we've got uncertainty. We have to bring probabilistic reasoning into a shared control structure and make sure that what we were doing was safe and give the user options to have more or less control depending on the context, depending on their uh, bodily performance that day. So that's an example of a particular application. Once you start to think about this, you might also think, normally in HCI you're trying to get maximum throughput, maximum communication, but actually if we're trying to avoid people becoming continually addicted, I'm sure you've all, if you use social media, you've experienced sitting down on your sofa in the evening, you're a bit tired, and you start poking at your tablet or your phone, and before you know it, a few hours have gone by. <coughs> now, we're seeing popularity of things like Amazon's Echo to speech interaction, but one of the reasons that it's popular is that you can do certain things with it, but other things become more difficult. So you can, if you try and do anything too complicated, it becomes a pain to use. Uh, and that means that you're not getting addicted. Why do people often, who many people who have uh, an iPad, would also buy a Kindle e-reader? Part of that is, although the Kindle does offer you the ability to go to web pages and so on, it's difficult to use. It's designed not to really be doing that for emergency use only. So it's preventing you from distracting yourself away from the books that you're reading. And so I think it's interesting to think about how we can explicitly design bottlenecks and interaction. We want to encourage certain types of, uh, of behaviors. We want to say, okay, we want to be able to read peacefully. How can we build a device that lets us do that while not being able to do other things? Maybe unless we push it. So we maybe get into a mode where, yes, we can read, but we have to push it quite hard to get out of uh, that more locked in mode. Okay, now, trying to infer what level of casualness to use is a really interesting challenge. You can go behavioral, so you can see how people are engaging with the system or you can design explicit interaction mechanisms. And the, the work that Pirola was just describing with the pressure work that was done with uh, some of my colleagues is a really nice example. Very natural, very intuitive, simple way of changing the level of engagement. So that balance between the use of the language model and the precision of the user input is exactly what I'm talking about here. So you could either type very precisely or you can be more relaxed in your typing and delegate more to the language model. But if you know something about the context that you don't trust the language model, you're putting in somebody's name, you're putting in a local dialect word, then that won't work. So you, you can push hard and say, no, just do what I tell you. Okay, so let's get back to some of the questions you maybe have heard of David Hilbert. He placed some very fundamental questions for mathematics. And we all know that Ante is the next Hilbert. So Ante sent us five questions. He, here are the century-defining questions from Professor Roosevelt. Um, what has AI or machine learning to give to HCI? What is HCI to give to AI? Deep learning, is it all bollocks or uh, useful? Um, and artificial general intelligence, how do you see it from your own point of view? What are the outstanding challenges? So I'll try and address a few of these to whatever degree I think is appropriate. Okay. So obviously machine learning can give us new ways of controlling systems. So we can take high dimensional inputs, 
and bring them down to controllable spaces using machine learning. So we can have rich input, we can have natural user interfaces, which may be speech, which may be uh, pose based. Uh, we can take the brain computer interface that I was just describing. So these take very high dimensional dynamic time series and turn them into something you could use to control the system. We might make existing systems faster or more power efficient. We can personalize the user's experience. So should we be uh, describing the potential you have to get uh, personalized language models and what that would do? Um, and we can transfer experience we've made with other users to a, to you. So you you may have never interacted with the system, but if the system can say you are similar in some way to this group of users, then we can more rapidly warm up your system. So again, we can try and think of this diagram and say, okay, which of these elements can now benefit um, from machine learning, and that helps us get some structure. Another diagram I'd like to put up is taking on some old work from Don Norman um, from the 70s with these effort performance graphs. So these would be ways in which you look at different technical systems and try and understand what was going on. And you could argue that the whole point of artificial intelligence and machine learning is really just to push this graph up. It's to say, for a good level of effort, can you get more performance out of your system? And we were hearing from the first two talks about how language models and appropriate inference can let you type on smaller devices, types with less precision, and achieve good performance. And what we quite often find is that systems require a certain amount of effort before you get any performance, and that that can be pushed significantly back by using intelligent systems. But I think it's always important when you see something like this to say, well, what information is filling that gap? Where does it come from and what intentions are behind it? You might have a system that is really ethically designed and it's all about trying to support you and it's got the best intentions. Or it could be that this is just what Google or Facebook want to sell. So maybe this is picking music for you so you don't have to generate a playlist yourself. And it might be a best guess of what you want to listen to or it might be something that a contract has been signed behind the scenes to push particular things on people who seek vulnerable for that, whether that's news, whether that's music. So always think about where these missing bits are coming from if you've not put them in yourself. Okay, it's also pretty tough to apply machine learning in HCI. A lot of the interesting data is not yet labeled, so you can't use supervised methods. You might the alternative is you have labeled data, but that was collected in unrealistic lab settings. So how could we change things to be able to gather more data from in the wild and in further contexts? So humans are complicated, so we could potentially have very complicated value functions. But what matters to humans? So quite often machine learning makes very naive assumptions uh, about what matters. And making things like distance measures on images are really tricky to get right. So. Um, the goals for machine learning are far from trivial. You've got lots of heterogeneity in the user population. Everybody's different. How can you manage that? The, um, the adaptation of a system, once the user is getting to learn that, means that you then have lots of chicken and egg situations where you've got users adjusting to something, the system adjusting to them, and that can lead to instability. And evaluating the performance of the final system is also far from trivial. Some examples of where we see the benefits. So this is again some nice slides John prepared uh, for a summer school we had um, last year. And here you're seeing the process of how machine learning and computational reasoning can help you build systems. So you maybe start with some reasonably simple intention that you want to achieve. But you have to now map that into a physical space with your body, however you do that. And that has to be sensed by a sensor space. That's often a very high dimensional uh, problem. So you've gone from something that was quite simple intention, and you've now maybe got several megapixels per second um, of sensing coming in, and you have to bring this down somehow. You have to find a control space that the user can relate to rather than the million dimensional space. How can you build that? So a lot of the challenge for combining machine learning and interaction is to say, 
how can we map through the high-dimensional sensors to a low-dimensional space that the user can actually relate to and control things in? And this gets back to um, some of the challenges around modeling, and Pirro just gave a very nice talk on the importance of models, so I don't need to linger on this, but I do think uh, getting these models, whether first principles are learned into HCI, is a really important area. Um, okay. So some other examples of where we've been using it. Um, I think one of the interesting things is going to be how we combine subjective information of how people feel about certain things with objective data. And one interesting example of this is using music. So we work together with a small village company, Woodage, and they have used machine learning to basically map raw music files, predictions of emotional responses, and genre, and so on. And I think it's quite a nice example of many challenges that we're going to have where we have some objective data. And the important thing is to relate that to humans and how they feel about it. And so it, it's a good example of something which will come up again and again. So we have some feature extraction, we have some, some mapping, and we have to have some training data. So in this case, we use music students to tag a number of uh, songs, and then we generalize that to new music. Um, and we can see some visualizations of what's this. Just, uh, So here's a um, so here's an example of um, a system where we've got thousands of tracks that have been projected to a 30-dimensional space and then brought back down to a two-dimensional space. As you browse around it, you'll see different colors appearing. Um, these are showing you the probability of particular moods and their responses, so you can explore the space. And the system is giving you some insight into what's going on. Um, and you can generate playlists using this sort of technical infrastructure. Now, this is something that engineers like to play with, but it's a bit nerdy for um, standard users. In a moment, I'll show you something that we did with Van Rolison. But I'll also show um, some other visualizations that we made with Julie and John Williamson, where we were exploring how you could create a new device to view these sorts of systems. Oops. We should be getting audio. Is there audio on the system? If not, don't worry about it. Um, basically, it's, it's a touch sensitive sphere, and you can display your data on that and then explore it. And one of the nice aspects is that you um. <laughs> the pop-up sphere is a spherical display continuous third third display. The form factor allows multiple users to gather around the display and experience content together. This project explores how high dimensional data sets can visualize and curve surface in ways that can't be achieved with a flat display. The project uses a high dimensional data set from Synthetic, which describes the moods of music. Using machine learning, we create a layout based on these moods that creates galaxies as a music types. The moon and galaxy is mapped onto the torus, which is then presented on the sphere. This allows for continuous browsing of data across the curved surface. With over 30,000 interactive points, users can browse through music by moves. Okay, so that's something fun new device, playing around with visualization of the data. So that was one element. Another one we had was working with Bannon Wollison. They wanted to, they liked the idea of using this to simplify some machine learning. Well, it seems complicated, it can sometimes be used to simplify interaction. So they wanted to get a minimalist music system. And so the, their flagship product from 2015 was the idea that Danny Boland uh, presented to them as part of the collaboration and a co-funded PhD process. And it basically boiled that, we took the two-dimensional space down to a one-dimensional circle, that circle that you see on the right, 
It was a simple way for people to interact with music and pick different genres of music um, so that they could have a very simple way of engaging. If they wanted to engage further, they could flip the device around and it had a touch screen on the other side and they could have a more engaged interaction with that. So it's a nice example of this casual engaged uh, spectrum of work. And if you do things with industry, they make nice videos for you as part of their marketing, as part of the academic benefit. Perfect match. Loves my taste in music. Lights up when I'm around. Makes me feel like home. And it's always in the right mood. You get, you get the idea. Um, but there, it's interesting as well to think again about the ethics. So. What if our machine learning hasn't done its job right? What if certain tracks don't fit easily into the manifold that we found? If this became a standard way of engaging with music, then certain bands might never be visible to users. So we make these things to make our lives easier, but they make a large part of the world potentially invisible to us, and we're maybe not aware of that. Okay, what does HCI have to give machine learning? Obviously, we've got skills in visualization of data, we've got processes for finding the goals of machine learning processes. Often machine learners tend to say, okay, I've got a cost function, I've got data, I'm happy, but are they looking at the right thing? Um, what are the consequences of getting it wrong? Is often something that machine learning engineers tend not to care too much about. They just do their thing, they've got a cost function, and thinking in a broader systematic way, in the way Carola was describing, is maybe necessary. There's a lot of interesting potential for human in the loop machine learning, where we're doing this sensitivity analysis, looking at results, trying to understand whether we've got the right, right cost functions. And obviously, we're going to need more and more explanation of what is going on in black box models, and that's going to require um, human computer experts and machine learners to work together. And we've seen lots of examples of systems getting things wrong, whether it's from a an Apple Watch calling emergency services when you're having sex, to image processing classifying African Americans as gorillas, to not tracking black people in particular tasks. So if you've got a homogeneous group of developers, then you sometimes miss out on testing certain types of users, and that would potentially be less likely to happen with more, more HCI people involved in the process. Um, just another one of Auntie's questions was deep learning. You know, how does it affect your your work, and how will it affect HCI? Um, we've been using it in a number of tasks. We were working with the company on a, a capacitive screen that could sense five centimeters above the, the uh, surface, and they wanted to have improved pitch yaw and position estimates from the the data. Um, you can use you can either take a forward rolling approach where you um, understand the physics of the device and try and work out, solve the inverse problem from that form model, or you can do a regression approach where you just grab the data and try and correlate the two, and you can do these together. So we use deep networks to, to fit both types of models. So you can take uh, an electrostatic simulation, and to do that for this particular task it took about 80 seconds per pose on a, a high power PC. But we could train a neural network based on data with that simulation, speed things up two and a half million times, and then you could use that in real time on a mobile device. And so we built a particle filter that used both the forward and backward model implemented as deep networks running on mobile devices. So but one of the things that you then find is actually trying to hold your finger at a particular pose doesn't always work. So uh, John suggested the, the use of flow inter flow based interaction. So rather than trying to hold your finger steady in a particular pose, how, why not look at the flow of the sensed information of the screen? And there might be examples where you, you don't want to touch the screen, you want to run your hand over it if you're in the kitchen cooking, for example. Um, and so the idea was to take optical flow ideas and apply them to um, capacitive sensors and complex gestures would then turn into these sorts of streamlines and you would represent these as uh, particular ways of engaging with your, your device. So different types of um, gesture would have associated streamlines and these could be detected quite easily um, 
think Daryl implemented this running at 60 hertz on a mobile phone of the era 2013 14, right? Something like that. Yeah, mobile Yeah. <laughs> but it was it, it worked on eight year old or four year old technologies. So let's just see some visualizations of these. This is a subtly obscure device. Uh, but you're seeing the raw sensor readings there. And then you can see it's responding differently to different directions of movement. And you can have different curl div operators applied to the data to detect whether you're going in and coming out. And you can create these Harry Potter style interactions where you have quick clicks for gestures and you don't have to hold your hand in a very specific position. Okay. So you can imagine these in layers applied to the, the, the system. Okay. Um, other things have been up to recently, which are maybe not directly um, HCI, but they are enhancing our sensing. We've been doing a lot of work with physicists, and one of the challenges we've been looking at is imaging through multi-mode optical fiber. So you put an image in one end of the fiber, and what you see out at the end is, uh, is confused, and you get a speckle result. But the, the goal would be, could we learn from the speckles what the input was? Because if you could get that right, then you could potential in things like endoscopy with much finer cables. And the challenge is putting in a single pixel leads to a really wide dispersion of outputs and there are complex valued interactions uh, with phase uh, effects in the, the cables. So the sum of the two pixels there is not the same as the sum of the two outputs. Um, and the idea was to try throwing standard uh, cross-encoding mechanisms to solve the inverse problem. Um, and that turned out to do quite a nice job. Uh, but the, what we then did was say, actually, we know something about the physics of this. We know that there's a transmission matrix that is a complex valued matrix. We know it's orthogonal because of the structure of the, the physical problem. Um, so we then made a complex valued matrix and we forced it to be unitary. And you can see the predictions that we're getting. The bottom line is the prediction for the input at the, the top line. And the physicists were pretty surprised by this because they had previously never been able to get things going through more than about 30 centimeters. And these are some of Moybridge's original videos, and we're just putting them through the fibers. The upper ones are the one meter fiber, the lower ones are 10 meter fiber. And that's you know, an order of magnitude further than anybody's been able to do analog imaging. Um, and it was done with off-the-shelf tools, Keras, with a little bit of adaptation. And the reason I'm showing this is you were asking about the benefits of this. And this was done by somebody straight out of undergraduate um, engineering, had never done a machine learning course. They were able to pick up these off-the-shelf tools and adapt them to put in complex valued weights and to put in a unitary constraint on the regularization. Things which, you know, when I was finishing my degree would be months of faffing around with code, getting my derivatives wrong, having to do it again, I wouldn't have been able to knock it up in a few weeks. So I think this is exactly what the ratchet effect that um, we're seeing in machine learning that we haven't been seeing in HCI. We haven't seen much of people really building on each other's work in, in HCI in terms of being able to really deliver faster, more reliable solutions. Um, so I think this software engineering in ML where we're sharing data, because to get these results, I was able to just grab large amounts of uh, image data from standard collections. I was able to grab standard code and get things running very nicely. And I think we're going to see combinations where you could think of TensorFlow probability, where you can have nice uh, probabilistic models where you've got first principles information, you can build a model like that, but then you can put it in the same TensorFlow graph as some empirically learned uh, deep networks. And I think that's going to be the way to go. Okay, I think I'm probably on my overtime now. Am I to end? Okay. Okay, a few other examples of things where we've been using deep learning. Um, we've been uh, using 
single pixel detectors in in order to test new ways of sensing systems as part of our quantum imaging hub where physicists can come up with a new device based on some exotic property and we can detect single photon avalanches and we can have very precise timing but to use this in an imaging task would require two orders of magnitude more expense to get that tested so instead what you can do is use a digital mirror array which is it's the same as what you have in a data projector, a uh, single photodiode of some exotic form. And if you know the basis of the mirror combinations, you can then solve the inverse problem and find out what that image was. The problem is if you, if you want to do this at high speed, you're limited by the sampling speed of these mirrors, which is about 20 kilohertz. So that means you have 666 observations per frame if you want to do 30 hertz video. So what we did was we decided to try and optimize this by treating the whole thing as if it was a, an autoencoder network. But we implemented the first part of that autoencoder with the mirror array. So that meant it had to be binary. So we learned from an image collection and we pushed the initial layers to be binary and then we just implemented them in the optics. And the second layer is taking this compressed sensing form and trying to regenerate an image from that. Um, so we learning some basis functions and these would be different for different image collections depending on what you're applying it to but these are the images of the recreated um, data from these uh, things so you see quite smooth representations and to get a sense of how this has improved things the right hand side would have been what physicists were using previously and the left hand side is what our network has learned and this was obviously not this is one of the the guys from physics we were working with, Matt Edgar, so he wasn't part of the training data, it's generalized to him. So again, that's a, an interesting way we've been able to just take these off-the-shelf devices, tweak them a bit um, to the specifics of a physics problem, and then get some interesting results that are new to the physicists. And now we're, in a way, we're going to bring that back to something that might be useful for human-computer interaction, we're inverting this so that we now project the laser through the mirrors onto the scene. And this lets us do 3D sensing at up to kilometers because the laser signal can be much stronger than a traditional depth camera. And in this one, we're combining the timing data from the lasers with RGB to depth. Models. So you can now take um, training data where you have the visible light image and the depth image. And you can bring that together to make a neural network that you can run on your mobile phone now with TensorFlow uh, Mobile, uh, where you can predict depth maps from the scene. But they have some biases, and the precision of the timing data can then improve that. So these are nice examples of um, machine learning making things fairly straightforward in novel sensing. The artificial general intelligence question, I, I don't have particularly strong views on. I think, yes, it's going to happen, the big question is when. What I think is important is how we respond to this. So I think humanity is going to be defined in how we choose to work together with intelligent systems and how we make sure that we share the benefits that come from that with all the population. And we're going to have to think about how we change our education for a world where there are systems which are able to do certain types of intelligence tasks better than us. How do we recreate the value of value in this world? Okay. Where am I going next is where we're starting to do some work on what we call closed loop data science. So one of the things that I think has been overlooked in a lot of the machine learning data hype has been the fact that if you're wanting, most of the time we're wanting to gather lots of information about the world in order to build models of it and in order to use these models to better control the world. So whether it's a smart city or a profitable company, we are going to change the world. But the problem is, if you're actually gathering data from a closed loop context, then you have problems separating the controller from the system that you're modeling. So, and almost every working system is being controlled at the moment. And if you've done, how many of you have done control theory? You're right. Have you done system identification? And you were taught in system identification that closed loop identification is problematic and usually is avoided. But if you're going to do things on the real world, you don't want to just let things go loose. You want things to be somewhat controlled. 
And so this is a big challenge for the complex systems that we're working with now, is how to bring these insights from control theory into data science. And it also means that you've got, once you've changed the system, you've moved the system to a different point in the state space, and if you didn't have a first principles model in the first place, you're going to have to relearn your model. And then if you have human beings in the system, they're predicting the overall behavior of the system, and they're going to change their behavior. So you've got these uh, feedback loops at multiple levels, which are going to make life very complicated. And so far, I don't see a, a principled approach to this being used widely in either machine learning or large-scale data science. So part of our task is to work with a number of companies and institutions. We've got the Urban Big Data Center. We've got big companies like JP Morgan involved in the project. <coughs> and the UK funders have given us three million to, to work on this for the next three years, so that's going to be something keeping me busy. Um, the other aspect of this is any system that's being controlled, the whole point of control is to reduce certain types of variation, so that means you've also lost a lot of information about the system that you're looking at. Okay, so let me just think about some of the outstanding Last question, what are the outstanding challenges and opportunities? So I've just touched on the closed loop work, which I think is going to be a really interesting area. I think following on what Pirola was saying, getting a proper engineering approach where you have this ratchet effect where every year you feel you're making progress. If you look at computer vision and how that's made progress by applying the deep learning model, every year performance is going up. At HCI conferences, I don't have the same impression that things are always moving forward. Things are moving around, things are moving in circles. Some things are potentially moving forward, but there's no guarantee that a paper at CHI 10 years later is going to be better performance on a given task uh, in many areas that CHI publishes. And I think trying to make sure that we have more of this ratchet effect where people are sharing models, sharing data, agreed on how to do that, it's going to be really important for making it a more scientific area. Um, now, using things like control theory in HCI was often difficult in the past. Some of the models appealed to people who had a control training, for example, but because it was so dependent on the richness of human perception, making realistic tests of that was often problematic. I think it's going to be really interesting to see now that we've got the high perceptual performance of deep networks, together with some of the things like Google DeepMind's lab and OpenAI's gym, where you can have dynamic environments where you can test systems on real interaction tasks. And will that be a major step through where we can apply these models more reliably? Um, and you can think of things like the connect, why the connect didn't succeed. There you had a product that had a, a large initial success, but designers didn't know how to work with the high dimensional data that came out of it. It did its job pretty well, but people didn't know how to work with these complex skeletal dynamics. And HCI didn't give them a framework for making progress there. And I think we're going to go through the work. Trying to work out how much, what's the point of AI? Are we trying to replace humans or are we trying to support humans? There may be areas where we do just replace humans completely and the intelligence system works there. But if we do that in everything in life, then what are we here for? So how do we work out what the best way is for intelligence systems and AI you know, to work together? What if we're designing systems to train us rather than just replace us? And what happens when we get things wrong? You know, so we've seen lots of situations where algorithms have taken over the way we get news, the way we communicate with each other, they shape the way we talk to each other, they shape what we see. And we can ask, would Trump be in power? Would Brexit be happening if it wasn't for the joys of machine learning? And that's something that is hard to pin down at the moment, but it's something that we're going to see more and more challenging in the future. Okay, so I think wrapping up, um, we need to think about how we can get people deeper to re engaging with systems in the future. We need to be able to bump the cognitive support up or down, depending on our context. The tightly coupled nature of engagement that we have at the moment is highly addictive. Is that something we want to continue? 
where we see ongoing damage. You know, somebody said, is this the, is this the smoking uh, of the, you know, the debate that smoking had in the 50s and 60s? Are we just starting that process now in terms of the damage we're maybe doing to our children with social media? Um, so how can we get some more distance? How can we create interaction techniques that let us step back from our tools now and again? Um, and there are lots of challenges for how you combine these things. Are we going to go behavioral? We have the powerful models of human behavior. Are we going to create clever interfaces like the pressure-based approach that we're describing, where we can loosen the reins using specific interaction styles? Um, and how can we create optimal interaction bottlenecks to disengage at the right moment? Thank you. So, a um, lot of your questions and concerns uh, we have to also share. Um, it's also puzzling that what are the solutions? Uh, for example, the, uh, for a lot of interactions, uh, problems we care about is at such level, it's, 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 it's very intimate, very much close to and the human behavior is made very much modified by whatever the current government yeah. is. So therefore, there's not a snapshot that you can capture a data set that we use either for training or for evaluation that would be meaningful. Um, but um, on the other hand, you, you, you have to start from somewhere. So we have used both methods like more just Collect data on a fixed condition that is as as uh, natural or innate as possible. Like we don't give any feedback, don't run any algorithm. Like in people, you can just ask people, uh, pretend they're typing or give me some superficial feedback, or always give, use a reason, but ask people if they always give them what they're supposed to return, uh, assuming they're not cheating. And then you use those data set. Usually, for the small for 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 training, but it might be enough for for evaluation. So yeah. that's one approach. Everyone has its own different challenges. The other approach seems to be just some sort of cold evolution. That is, you use the current algorithm, you you run it, and you collect data, and that data, no, although knowing that it's it's it's, it's affected by the algorithm itself, but still by retraining it you may move the network to the right direction. And next time around, I think related, you need to notice that speech gets much more tolerant to natural speech now. Yeah. Like you can hesitate, you can or revise your sentence and be quite complete, and then the system eventually get it well, get it what they should get rather than uh, in sentence correction. Okay. So there seems to be emerging but it also struggle with this problem. I think and one of the things is that I think every, so obviously, almost every successful system out there must be doing something clever to deal with the closed loop issues in some way. And it's, a, it's implicit in some of the ways information retrieval, basically Google works, uh, or textual queries has changed over time. Um, it's, you know, people used to have lists of useful sites that would be useful as resources because Google got better, there was no point in keeping them updated. So the technology moves on, and every subfield has been making specific changes to their approach that work there, but they haven't been talking to each other and trying to say, well, actually, we've got this general problem. You know, how can we describe that mathematically, and then what do we do in each of our fields? And so that's one reason for the particular project that we've started. We've brought together data systems people, uh, information retrieval people, control engineers, statisticians, because we want to try and learn from each other about what has worked in each field. So if you've got recommender systems recommending films, do you know if the user watching this film is just because they were lazy and they just took the recommendation that the system gave them, or because they actually liked it? And or is it that you're shaping their behavior because you keep on giving them, you know, they, they had they started off using their the system and they had exotic tail like tastes, but you gradually push them towards the mode of the distribution because otherwise the system didn't work and so they gave up all their 
individuals, they just became consumers who were taking the load, uh, like films. That may never have been the intention of the recommender system team, but it's just something that the user said, well, if I want to use this stuff to manage the complexity of the environment, I just do that, and that, that gradually changes their taste. And I think that would be the sad aspect of the implications of intelligence systems, and rather than enhancing diversity and enhancing people being able to explore music and films and literature, they all just start to become like the residents of one new ship uh, being fed this year's fashion and consuming it in a very passive manner. One more quick question. One question about the uh, humans. You mentioned that they're, they're humans are very heterogeneous and that there are lots of those uh, different uh, people. As computers now know my, my mood and they know my political opinion and my sexual orientation and uh, so forth, uh, how much uh, do they know about the, uh, does Google know my learning abilities or cognitive abilities and so and uh, how much? Uh, could that be used uh, in adaptation in, in, in uh, different services, for example? And then also, can that uh, give an easy measure for IQ, for example? So, uh, I think it's one of the things I mentioned was the, there's this challenge of the warm up thing about how much do you have to interact before the system can give you useful input. But if, if by knowing these other features of you from other bits of their network, they can say, actually, you are ready, although you, we've never interacted with you on the floor before, we have interacted with you in these other domains and we think you are subtype A, B, Z, or and people in the 10 million people in this category like these sorts of films. So you then get categorized as that type of person. And one of the interesting things is how do these categories change over time? Because that might have been an interesting way to do things at one point, but for example, politically now America has transformed into Trumps and non-Trumps, and Britain has transformed into Brexiters and non-Brexiters, and you're starting to see all subcultures of behaviour around these new things. So some of these classification schemes may have been a useful tool some time ago, but they are changing now, and they're also changing the way people see themselves. So the polarisation of communication has changed the way people view other people. So previously, See, the British scenario, uh, you know, you had a bunch of journalists and they had all the people who might view them as a whole wide range of views, but now people are often crushing this complexity down to what he's a leader, he's a remainder, and that changes whether they're willing to listen to them or not. So you'll get particular topics which really start to redefine the way people interact with each other, and that's the way to have not one effect in other areas of life. Thank you, Lord, and let's thank all the speakers for the symposium of Thank you.